I am Mickey Ibarra, founder and chairman of the Latino Leaders Network, host of the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series. You know, it is somewhat shocking to me that in 2007, we have but six, six Hispanic statewide elected officials in the country when we exclude our three United States senators, six. We are delighted, however, that one of those six have joined us for our Latino Leaders Luncheon Series today. And of course, I speak of Susan Castillo, the Oregon State Superintendent of Public Instruction, who is here with us at the head table. We will start our lunch with a prayer, a blessing on our food, offered by former Congressman Bobby Garcia of New York. Bobby? What Mickey Ibarra is trying to do is very clearly written on our invitation, it says Latino leaders. And I think we really have an obligation as leaders to know each other, and more importantly, where possible, to work with each other. For 25 years as a senator and as a United States congressman, I used to take these podiums and Frank's looking at me with those inquisitive eyes and always talk about how great I am. Oh, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. Now Mickey has given me the privilege of coming to you, not to talk about myself, but to talk about him, our creator. So in that light, I thank you once again, Mickey, for your leadership. I thank you for what you've been able to do in putting us together. But more importantly, I thank you that you know that God should be present. And by asking me to pray, I will bring everybody together to take it before the Lord. If you'd be kind enough to bow your heads, and I will bless the food. But Lord, we thank you. We thank you because you are who you are, our maker and our creator. We thank you for the food that you have prepared for us. We thank you, more importantly, my Father, for those of us who have you, you have put together as the leaders of a community that is in continual growth. I pray for them, my Father, because much more important than being the leaders of today sitting at this table to make sure we have many more leaders in the future sitting at other tables. And so, my Father, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you because we know who you are, that you're the King. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and all good things come from you. And in your name we say, all together, amen. This is the 10th event of the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series that began in 2004. This event is intended to provide a platform in our nation's capital for Latino leaders to convene quarterly to share our personal stories of obstacles overcome to achieve success. By doing so, the Latino Leaders Network hopes this luncheon series will help our leaders know more about each other, listen to each other, learn from each other, care for each other, and assist each other. We as a leadership community must be better to each other. The Latino Leaders Network will build each other up. Others may try to tear us down. We will build each other up. Don't you agree? The signature events of the Latino Leaders Network include this quarterly luncheon, the Latino Leaders Issue Hour, and the Latino Mayor's Tribute. On Sunday, June 24th, the next Latino Mayor's Tribute will be conducted in Los Angeles during the United States Conference of Mayors to honor Mayor Antonio Villarigosa for his terrific leadership of our nation's second largest city. For more information on that event and others, 
I invite you to visit latinoleadersnetwork.org. Today's event is made possible by Verizon Communications and also the Coca-Cola Company. We are grateful for their long-standing support of our Latino community. In addition, we want to thank the Anheuser-Busch Company for sponsoring our pre-luncheon reception. As Bobby indicated, one of the primary reasons for this event is to get to know each other. I think we make a, an assumption that is proven to be incorrect when we assume we know each other. So we're going to take a moment to acknowledge some of our special guests and leaders that have joined us today. And I want to start with who I believe is an icon, a leader of the Latino community perhaps, more well-deserved than any other, with over 30 years of experience and leadership, the man who built the National Council of La Raza, Raul Isiguirre. <laughs> By the way, if you're not aware yet, uh, Raul has found work after the NCLR. <laughs> he is a presidential professor at Arizona State University in Tempe, and we're very proud of Raul's continued work in education. We also uh, have with us former Governor Bob Weiss, who is now the president of the Alliance for Excellent Education. Bob? Mayor Adam Ortiz of Edmonston, Maryland. Mayor? Right here. I'm so proud to welcome for her first Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, it won't be her last, her first, Rosemary Rodriguez, who is now a commissioner at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Also, Roberto Salazar, the Administrator for the Office of Food and Nutrition at the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> Cristina Caballero, President and CEO of Dialogue on Diversity. Cristina. <laughs> Juan Carlos Itucurue, President for the Foundation for Inter-American Bank. Juan Carlos. Gabriela Limas, the Executive Director of the Labor Council for Latin America, AFL-CIO. <laughs> Carmen Lomelin, the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission on Women at the Organization of American States. <laughs> Tom Oliver, President of the National Association of Hispanic Publications. Tom. We also have Clara Apadaka, excuse me, Apadaka, excuse me, Clara, but she'll, under, she'll understand how I could make that mistake. Clara Padilla Andrews, who is the former Secretary of State of New Mexico. We also have Alma Riojas, the President and CEO of MANA. Antonio Tierino, President and CEO of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Our teachers are well represented today in this room. Reg Weaver, President of the National Education Association. Reg. And also Dennis Van Rokel, Vice President of the NEA. Dennis. We also have Peter Zamora, the D.C. Regional Council of MALDEF. Peter. <laughs> Finally, just a, an announcement. I think it is worth mentioning that one of our past keynote speakers, Senator Bob Menendez, 
Yesterday was appointed as the vice chair of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Again, another leadership position for our community. With us to deliver sponsor remarks for Verizon is Emilio Gonzalez, a wonderful friend, a terrific advocate for our Hispanic community and many other important causes. Emilio is the executive director of public policy and strategic alliances at Verizon. Emilio? Buenos dias, bienvenidos. I was sitting here at the table and, and thinking how often they'll tell you at an event like this to tell, turn off your cell phones, but I work for Verizon, so please leave those on. <laughs> I want to share with you for one moment a true story, and, and it, it, it goes to the heart of, I think, my comments and a little bit about education. About a decade ago, I had the privilege of working for a wonderful man, the Secretary of Education, Richard Riley. And I visited a school in New Mexico they were very proud of it, a very poor school, but they had a fabulous technology lab. So I went and visited, and I'll never forget this little girl, must have been nine years old, working on a computer, and I said, what, you know, what are you working on? She said, I'm doing an essay on Socrates. I said, that's a pretty heavy subject for a girl your age. What's your conclusion? And she said, Socrates was a great man. He talked too much, so they killed him. And so. <laughs> I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for being here. I think without you, this would not be the celebration that it is. It is your presence and your energy that make this a, a wonderful event that I look forward to so often. I also want to thank our partners at Coca-Cola who have been with us since day one, and they have, they've just been wonderful to work with. Thank you, Frank. I want to introduce a couple of colleagues of mine from Verizon, Mr. Al Brown, who is the uh, heart and soul behind a technology platform called Thinkfinity, which is for teachers and students free. It's on the net, and if you don't know it, uh, I highly recommend it. It is a wonderful product, so thank you, Al. And my friend and colleague, Mr. B.K. Fulton, um, our vice president, our, one of our strongest supporters, and I think still a teacher at heart. I've learned much working with you. Thank you, Keith. Mickey, you continue to show us that it's the high road that will lead us to where we need to get as a people and as a community, and uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for your friendship and your, your, your counsel. Thank you. Finally, I want to say how delighted I am that we are honoring someone whose passion and commitment is, is to education. I've met Susan Castillo years ago at Mickey's office, and I walked away just incredibly impressed with what I saw and heard. On a personal note, Susan, I want you to know that it is my journey's been so much better because of caring and thoughtful teachers along the way. In fact, uh, I had a teacher, a professor, who really helped me get my, my start in Washington. And he always would tell me, I'm going to teach you the most important thing I know, the ability to learn to learn. And I am always grateful for people like that who take the time for young people who need it. So Susan, I want to congratulate you, and I want to leave you with the words of William Butler Yates. He said, education is not about filling a bucket. It is about lighting a fire. And I hope you continue to do that for our leaders of tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you, Emilio, and thank you, Verizon Communications. Now, representing the Coca-Cola company who has, as Emilio indicated, has been with us from the start, is Frank Ross, Assistant Vice President of Cultural Affairs. Frank. Muchas gracias, Mickey. It's got to bring a little Southern Spanish flavor to the luncheon here. But like Amelia, obviously we're honored to, to be here once again uh, at Coke. If you, those of you who see me do sponsored remarks, I believe the sponsors should have quick remarks. It's really getting caught doing good deeds versus talking about the deeds you do. 
and that really has been the philosophy since our, really our patriarch, Robert Woodruff, uh, ran the company. But on behalf of our chairman, Neville Esdell, and the over 50,000 Coca-Cola employees worldwide, I do want to thank you for being here. It's a great opportunity to bring leaders together. It is truly an honor, like I said earlier, to be able to, from the beginning of these series, be a co-sponsor with Verizon, who's done a great job as a partner. As always, I have to thank Mickey. I mean, he's, the guy's amazing. Uh, Barnum has nothing on him. He's a, he is a, a great, great promoter. He knows how to bring people together. And that's really the, the, the catalyst of getting change taking place. But also, be, we'd be remiss if we didn't thank his staff at Ibotta and Associates for providing really all Latino leaders that, that have the opportunity to come here uh, or willing to make a difference in, in, the, in the world we live in, the opportunity to share and learn knowledge. And to me, the exciting part of coming to these events is not the sponsor remarks, is not other, it's listen to the guest speakers that we have because it is about knowledge and understanding. And it's just interesting that today we have somebody that's in the field of education and that really where it all starts. If we want to give Latino children a dream, it is providing them the opportunity to get an education. And that really is the impetus that makes it go. <laughs> now, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug Coke a little bit in here. So, But the fact is, I'm very proud of the company I work for. Um, it has a long history of giving back to the communities which we serve. And actually, it's, it's part of the thread that makes up the fabric of our business. And as a result, it's a great sense of pride for the employees that work at the Coca-Cola Company to work for somebody that has done more for more communities and more people in more places around the world than probably any other company in history. And our goal is not just to be good corporate citizens, but it's to set a standard on good corporate citizenship where we can help develop sustainable communities. That is critical. And that's where the education part comes in. If you want to build your business, you better be a vibrant community. And the more vibrant, the, the more education is in that community, the more vibrant it becomes. It really does become a, 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 a catch-22. Our beloved uh, uh, chairman and, and former CEO, Roberto Gosuet, to put it best this way when he talked about the responsibilities of corporate America in the community, he said, Besides being the right thing to do, it's smart business. And really, when he said that, it just struck a chord because it, it really summarized what business and giving back is all about. Yes, it's the right thing to do, but also it's smart business. There's got to be a win-win proposition. Again, we look forward to the continuing work, continuing to work with you and the other leaders, both in the public and private sector, uh, mainly to strengthen the Latino community. That's what we come here together for, to see what we can do to develop. Besides being the right thing to do, we recognize, and it's very simple at Coke, and it really has to give an idea, our marketing department and our other areas, our Hispanic community uh, services, has gone from almost a 600% increase in the number of people we've dedicated to it. So we recognize the importance of it. Um, but we know that a strong Hispanic community means a stronger and better America, and when that happens, Everybody wins. So I hope you enjoyed the evening. Mickey, thanks once again for putting this together. Just several additional uh, acknowledgments I'd like to make. Guarione Diaz is also with us. Terrific Cuban-American leader in our community. Thank you, Guarione. We also have Octavio Hinojosa with the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. And at our head table, we also have Deborah DeLee, who is the Executive Director of Americans for Peace Now. Deborah DeLee. I must say this about Deborah. In 1984, before most of you were born, perhaps. <laughs> Deborah DeLee hired Mickey Ibarra at the National Education Association. And I'll tell you, she did a favor for me that I'll never, ever be able to fully repay. She put me on the road to the White House. And I will always be grateful, Deborah. Thank you.
At each luncheon, we reserve a three-minute portion of our program to learn more about a Latino organization that is dedicated to preparing our next generation of leaders. The National Hispanic Leadership Institute certainly qualifies. It is preparing Latinas to lead, and indeed the proud graduates continue to make a significant difference in Washington and throughout the country today. To tell us more about the important mission of the Institute, we are delighted to welcome Marisa Rivera Albert, its president and a leader we all admire. Marisa. Thank you, y buenas tardes. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially to honor um, Superintendent Castillo. It's always great to honor uh, Latinas in very successful positions. And Mr. Weaver, I have to uh, let you know that my daughter is on her first year as a teacher in North Carolina, and they're underpaid, under everything. So we need to, I mean, looking at it through the eye, I always knew that we need to do something about the teachers in, in our school districts, but definitely seeing it through the eyes of my daughter as the first teacher, I said, wow. You know, these are the people that are with our children hours on end, and we need to be supporting them more in every single way. So thank you for the work that you do. And I'm here to tell you about the National Hispanic Leadership Institute in three minutes or less, and I said, that's not fair, but I do have the short story and the long story. But the short story is really, to every story, there are two sides, right? Well, with the National Hispanic Leadership Institute, the status of Latinas is that way. When you see Latinas are leading a significant and powerful trend in America today, they are the fastest growing segment in, in, in business today. They are entering the workforce in record numbers. They're jumping in into running for office in record numbers, anything from city council to Congress. So that is the good news. Now, the other news is that Latinas are also the highest dropout rate in America. Latinas have the highest teen pregnancy in America. Latinas have the highest suicidal attempts and the highest gang involvement when you look at all the young uh, teens. So those are issues that the National Hispanic Leadership Institute deals with on a daily basis. And what do we do? We train the executive program. We put women, the movers and the shakers in the country through a four week of leadership training, one week at Harvard University, executive programs, one week at the Center for Creative Leadership, one week at, uh, uh, in California, and one week here in Washington, D.C. We also have a youth program, Latinas Learning to Lead, which we actually train our young Latinas to lead our country. And when you think about it, we do hear the negative statistics, but as I see it through the eyes of these young Latinas that are selected into the program, these are the, the, the ones that want to be the teachers and the superintendents. They're the ones that want to be the doctors. They want to be the president of the United States. So I do see there's hope behind all of those statistics. And that's what we're all about, to bring that gap together. And I hope you all join us in moving into preparing more Latinas for leadership positions at the National Hispana Leadership Institute. Muchísimas gracias. Reg Weaver, president of the National Education Association, America's largest organization of teachers and other education employees, has agreed to introduce our featured speaker. Reg Weaver, for all of the, you that know him, understand he is a tireless advocate for children and a champion for education. He is a man on a mission to ensure that every student in America has access to a great public school. Most recently, recognized by MALDEF for his extraordinary leadership at their Atlanta dinner last month, Reg is a regular guest here at the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series. We are grateful for his support, the support of NEA, and their commitment to the Latino community. Please join me in welcoming Reg Weaver to the platform. You know, a lot of people ask, well, what do you think about this? 
And what do you think about that? Well, I tell them I no longer listen to what people say. I watch what they do. And when it comes to education, you find so many organizations talk about education, but few do anything about it. And so when you have Mickey Ibarra and the Latino leaders having these luncheons, there's so many other things that they could talk about. But they have taken the time to spotlight education. And Mickey, I thank you. And if it were not for Mickey and the group, many of you would not have had the opportunity to see and to talk and to hear the person that I am about to introduce. Susan Castillo began her second term as Oregon State's Superintendent of Public Instruction in January of 2007 and first elected to a four-year term in May 2001. She oversees more than a half million students in over 1,200 public schools. Susan believes there's a strong connection between raising achievement for all students and getting Oregon on track to a future of economic growth and prosperity. She has focused on key priorities to improving education in Oregon, making the education system more accountable, promoting literacy, closing the achievement gap, improving middle and high schools, strengthening community ties, and making the Oregon Department of Education more efficient. Susan has launched major academic initiatives to improve performance of all students and to help close the achievement gap, including launching a comprehensive literacy plan so students not only learn to read, but also read to learn, increasing the number of families in Head Start and expanding full day kindergarten to every school in the state, revamping the high school diploma to ensure that graduates get a more rigorous, relevant education to prepare them for college and or careers, improving guidance and counseling at high schools, and cultivating new leadership in schools and districts through training and mentoring. Now, I could go on, and there are a lot of nice things that I have written here. But you know, a lot of times what is written down as an introduction is not the thing that moves you. I had a chance to, to spend some time with Susan. And this is not the first time we've had a chance to meet. But folks, when you are in positions such as she's in, you should take the opportunity to do something for the people that you represent. And Susan has done and is continuing to do that. She used to be in, in broadcasting. And then she said, well, maybe that's not enough. Maybe I can make a better contribution if, in fact, I went to the legislature. She was the first Hispanic woman to be elected to Senate in the state of Oregon. And her commitment was to make sure that the students that everybody talked about had something done on their behalf. And Susan has made it happen, despite the fact that there has been a shortage of funds. Susan said, just because there is a shortage of funds, we should not forget the children. And she did not allow that to happen. And so it's folks like these that I am so proud to be associated with. It's folks like these who the children of America have to pay thanks to. It's people like these who look out for the children that look like us. And so Susan, I want to thank you on behalf of every person and every student that never had a chance to knock on your door to say thank you. And this body here, Susan, this body here, this body here recognizes the Hispanic culture, and it's, it has a tremendous gift to the fabric of our nation. And I don't know about you, but when I receive a gift, I always take care of it. 
Susan Castillo is a gift. And folks, let's take good care of her and give recognition and a standing ovation to the person that is looking out and taking care of Oregon's children, Susan Castillo. afternoon. Thank you so much, Reg. Wow. Thank you for your incredible leadership for our country. He is such an inspiring leader, and I know every time I talk to Oregon teachers and they hear Reg speak at any kind of national gathering or any gathering, they come back so inspired about what they do and their important role that they play for the children in our country. So thank you for all that you do with your leadership. Thank you, Mickey Ibarra, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for your leadership. You are an inspiring leader for the Hispanic community all across this country. What a role model you are for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> well, it is a, a great honor to be with all of you today. I'm in a room filled with fabulous uh, Latino leaders. So uh, it is very much an honor to be with you and to share some comments with you. And I'm gonna start my comments by uh, making a confession, a little confession about what I was like as a student. I was uh, pretty much a mediocre student. I wasn't, a, I wasn't like a bad kid, but um, I was unmotivated when I was in school. I was pretty much a daydreamer. I doubt many of my teachers would even remember Susan Castillo. But as you heard today, I'm Oregon Superintendent of Public Instruction. I oversee a public school system with well over half a million students in 1,200 schools with an education budget topping $6 billion. America, what a country, huh? <laughs> I'm a West Coast Latina, born in East LA, the grandchild of Mexican immigrants. My dad was a sheriff's deputy. My mother worked in a factory. She left school in the eighth grade and she always used to encourage me and my brothers to earn a living with our brains rather than with our backs, as she did. When I was uh, little, we moved to a mostly white middle-class suburb because my parents wanted us kids to have opportunities that they didn't think that we would get in the Los Angeles uh, neighborhoods that they grew up in. I went to high school in the late 60s, a pretty crazy time to be a teenager, but um, I wasn't a big rebel, because remember, my dad was a cop, so I couldn't get in too much trouble. <laughs> uh, the one demonstration that I did take part in was a little sit-down um, at school to protest uh, the school administration's objectives, uh, objections to students wanting Steppenwolf, remember the rock group Steppenwolf, to perform at our school. Remember Born to be Wild? That was us. Well, anyway, that was pretty much the extent of my uh, radical student activism, was that sit-down strike. And after I graduated, I didn't really um, believe that college was for me. My parents made sure, of course, that uh, me and my brothers did complete our high school education. But in my household, as I was growing up, we didn't really have conversations about what university I was going to be going on to. And no one in my high school talked to me about going to college or have get me even thinking about the possibility of college. I did, however, enroll in a junior college. I took a few classes, I dropped out, I kind of floated, like a lot of um, people do in their late teens and early 20s. And a few years later, I found myself in Oregon working in the secretarial pool at Oregon State University. I was what you call a late bloomer. <laughs> My life took a sharp turn when I got assigned to work as secretary to an amazing woman named Pearl Spears Gray, who at the time was the head of the university's affirmative action pro uh, program. Pearl was a wonderfully dynamic, outspoken African-American woman. She was a fearless and tireless advocate for justice, and she moved people and institutions with her courage and intelligence. And I was pretty much in awe of her every day. And Pearl saw something in me that most of my teachers probably missed. She saw potential. Pearl was my mentor, 
She encouraged me to go to school and to earn my degree. And during a time in my life when I didn't know what I wanted to do or be, Pearl believed in me, and at that point, that was all that I needed. And I want to take a moment here to just emphasize the important role that we play as leaders to mentor others and how powerful those words are when you say to someone else, you have potential. Let me help you set high goals for yourself. You can be successful in college. They can change someone's life when we say those words. And Pearl's words certainly changed mine. As a student at Oregon State, everything changed. I was motivated to hit the books, to really get into learning. I loved it. I was like a sponge. And I earned my degree and started my journalism career as a news reporter and anchor for a local television station in Eugene, Oregon. And I was feeling quite content with my broadcasting career. I loved it when I was approached about becoming a state senator. I spent so many years covering politics from the outside with a reporter's objectivity, but I also wanted to try to make a difference in the public policy arena. And when I finally decided to, to do it, I can remember sitting at home in front of my computer, writing my first political speech, talking about the major issues and where I stood on major issues, and talking about my story, my family, and my background. And as I went through and looked at the first draft, I could barely get through it because I became very emotional. I was, stand, I was sitting there in front of my computer and I was just crying. I was just sobbing and I didn't understand why I was so emotional. And then it hit me. At that moment, I was fulfilling the dream of my grandparents. They came to this country with very little. They worked. They struggled, they strived to make a living and to raise families. They really believed that this is the land of opportunity. And here I was getting to live that dream. And I have to tell you that that was a powerful, profound moment in my life. And it is at the core of what drives me in the public service work that I do today because Everyone should have an opportunity to live the dream, and that's what I work for. As the first Hispanic woman elected to the legislature in Oregon, I had something to prove. I worked very hard diving into issues from policy, farm worker rights, environmental protection, but I connected most with the issues related to education. So, for, so a few years later, when uh, when Democrats were looking for someone to run for school superintendent, which is a statewide elected position in Oregon, I gave it my best shot, and I won. And I'm now in my fifth year on the job after winning re-election. And I've pushed all sorts of issues and gotten mixed up with my share of uh, arguments and controversies. But from the start, my top priority has always been closing the achievement gap for poor and minority students. Across this country, you see poor students, you see minority students, millions, lagging behind in reading and math, failing and dropping out of school, and missing out on that dream. And for too long, society, and yes, schools, wrote off these kids as unable to learn or being unreachable. And there have been plenty of excuses. There was plenty of blame to go around, poverty, crime, drugs, dysfunctional families. Well, I don't believe in making excuses, especially when it comes to our kids. I believe in taking responsibility, and that is the work of closing the achievement gap. That's what it's all about, taking responsibility for our children. By far, the biggest, fastest growing demographic of kids is Hispanic. More than one out of five school children in this country is Hispanic, and that's more than a 50% increase since the early 90s. Now, Oregon is not California or Texas or Florida, <laughs> but like many states, we are experiencing a boom too. Today, Latinos represent 15% of our students in Oregon, and we're expected to double our numbers by 2020. Nationally, Latino students are more likely to come from poverty, Three out of four Latino kids qualify for free or reduced school lunch. Latinos don't do as well on reading and math tests. 
they're more likely to drop out, less likely to go to college, and throw in the number of English language learners, about five million kids across this country, and we've got our work seriously cut out for us in America's schools, let me tell you. But here's the good news. Nationally and in Oregon, we are beginning to narrow the achievement gap. And make no mistake, I mean, we have a long ways to go. We're not where we need to be. But we are making slow, steady progress. And believe me, we need to continue to approach this work with a sense of urgency all across this country. The most amazing thing, at least in Oregon, is that we did make progress on this issue during a time when our state budget was in a serious downturn and schools were being forced to make devastating cuts, eliminating programs, and increasing class sizes. Now believe me, money is important. We have a way to go to make sure that our schools in Oregon have reasonable class sizes and can offer our kids quality art and music programs and help them have those 21st century skills that they need to be successful. But money isn't everything, or else we wouldn't have been able to make the progress that we have been making. So how is it getting done? Well, there isn't a magic formula, there's no textbook with step-by-step -step instructions about how you close the gap, but I can tell you what's working in Oregon, at least when we look at our successful schools, the work that they're doing. Everything at the heart of the work, everything begins with high expectations for what students can achieve, all students. Just because a child lives in poverty, or his parents are too tired from working three jobs to help with homework, doesn't mean he's not smart or that she can't learn. Do you do everything you can to help that child cope with the challenges he faces outside of school? Absolutely. But do you lower your standards because you feel sorry for that child? No way. Let me tell you just um, about one of our wonderful principals in Oregon. Her name is Enadelia Schofield, and she's the principal of W.L. Henry Elementary School, where three out of four kids is Latino, and most come from poverty. She's got this call and response thing that she does when she visits with her students. She asks them, what's your job? And the kids call back, to learn. And then she asks, so when you grow up, you can go where? And all these beautiful kids answer, College. I just love that because most of these kids' parents never graduated from high school. And these kids are already thinking about going to college. That is the American dream right there. Next, you invest in early childhood education. I can make the argument that public education is vastly underfunded in this country from preschool all the way through higher education. If you want to make a smart, long-term investment with a big payoff in the future, you spend on preschool, full-day kindergarten, and extra help for our first graders so that these kids, when their brains are still developing, learn how to be learners and get their schooling off to the strongest possible start. And schools also need to do a better job getting parents and communities involved. You sometimes hear that culture and language throw up barriers that are difficult to overcome. And a lot of parents don't have much schooling themselves or their experience with the system has left them feeling wary and burned. And that all may be true, but we cannot throw up our hands and give up because all parents at heart want what's best for their children. Schools need to get more creative about reaching out offering after-school programs, night classes, social events. We need more training so that our teachers know how best to educate kids from diverse backgrounds. All teachers want their students to succeed. We need to help them do that. And I also believe that schools need to be more entrepreneurial about coordinating what they do with local governments and nonprofits and businesses big and small. There are resources out there. We just need to do a better job of tapping them. And finally, you need accountability. I talked about teachers holding high expectations for kids. 
Well, we need to have high expectations for our schools too. We have so much data now to track how students are doing. We need to press for progress. And not everything that goes on a classroom can be captured on a spreadsheet, but you do need to know how you're doing, whether you're a school, a teacher, or a student, if you want to know where you go. When a school is underperforming, we need to understand why and address those issues swiftly, whether that means shoring up leadership or changing the curriculum, and we don't play the blame game. And when we see a school that's excelling, that's really reaching for the stars with all of their students, we need to understand what's going on there too so we can make more of that happen in more schools. In Oregon, I started the Celebrating Student Success. It's a conference and a banquet to honor schools that are making a difference. And I have to tell you that that evening has become the highlight of my year. We recognize schools from the inner city and from tiny farm towns. And more importantly, everybody gets together to share on strategies that really work for our kids. Getting down to real specifics like how to organize schedules to boost literacy or how to improve attendance. There is so much amazing, innovative work going on in our schools. And too often, we focus on the failures when we have so much to learn from the success. I hope everyone in this room will join me, if you aren't already, getting involved in what's happening in our public schools. Whether that means raising money or awareness, volunteering in classrooms, or just being an advocate. Because I know what it feels like to be a kid who isn't connecting with school. And I bet I'm not the only one in this room. But I also know the thrill of finally getting it, of discovering a love of learning, and how education can transform your life. Now, since 9-11 and the Iraq War, education's been set aside nationally. If we really care about this country's future, we need to think big about our schools. Education needs to be put back at the top of our nation's priority list. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, insiders talk about education and No Child Left Behind, and there's lots of that talk going on right here in DC. But I can't believe that in both recent presidential candidate debates, whether it was the Democrats or the Republicans, there was no mention of education. And that needs to change. Absolutely. I see three key areas where we need to get to work right away. And one of them is calling out a national agenda to build an education workforce that is the best in the world. I have seen it time and again. A great textbook doesn't make a great education. You need quality teachers making that one-on-one -on -one connection with students. So let's get them the quality training and the support that they need to help every student succeed in this 21st century global economy. And let's develop strong leadership in our schools so that those leaders have the skills to create successful learning environments for our students. Two, let's make sure that our children do start school ready to learn. The achievement gap begins before children enter school. So we need quality preschool programs and parent training to ensure that when kids start kindergarten, they're not already behind. They're hitting the ground running. I tell you, it's much easier to do well in a race when you're not playing catch up from the very start. And three, Let's make some targeted investments in our middle schools and our high schools to help our struggling students. We can help students struggling in secondary school and get them on a, on a course to success if we make the right investments in our secondary schools. I believe that we as a nation can do better by our children than we're doing. I believe all children, no matter what color they are, what language they speak at home, or how much money their parents make are entitled to the very best education because every child is entitled to the dream. 
we can do better. And working together with intelligence, dedication, and passion, we will. There are so many students who are late bloomers like me who need that inspiration, who need to believe in themselves and have someone show them the way and help provide support to their school and their teachers so that they all have an opportunity to live the dream. Thank you very much. Thank you. Superintendent Castillo, on behalf of the Latino Leaders Network, we are honored today to present you with the Nambe oh Leadership God. Award for your wow. important contribution to our Latino community. Thank you so much. Thank you. you take that on the airplane home with you. We'll, we'll make sure that it gets to you. Just a couple of announcements before we conclude. And remember, we said we'd be out of here by two, and we will. First, our next event. The next Latino Leaders Luncheon will be September 19th, right here at the Capitol Hilton. I'm very pleased to announce that our keynote speaker is Omar Manaya the first general manager in Major League Baseball history, Omar Manaya, a Latino with the New York Mets, right here with us on September 19th. And by the way, I'm not making a commitment, but we're going to do our best to work a deal with the New York Mets and the Washington Nationals who play that night at RFK Stadium also. I also want to mention a date change. The final Latino Leaders Luncheon for 2007 has been moved now to November 7th, from the last week in October to November 7th. We have a materials table set up outside of the uh, ballroom here. We invite you to take this material on your way out. I also want to make a couple of announcements regarding our team at Mickey Ibarra and Associates. First, some of you may have missed Michelle Mingus Moore, the executive director of the Latino Leaders Network. Well, I wanted to let you know that Michelle gave birth to Tatiana Michelle Moore on May 9th. Both mom and baby are doing well at home. We expect Michelle to be back with us soon. I also want to introduce three new members of our team. We have uh, Melissa Lento, who is my new executive assistant and office manager. Melissa is right here. <clears throat> Melissa spent two years with uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of Houston. We're delighted to welcome Melissa to our team. In addition, Paul Gomez, who is currently a legislative assistant with Congressman Joe Baca, will be joining our team beginning Monday May 21st. Where is Paul at? There we go. Right here. Paul Gomez. <laughs> Finally, Yvette Gonzalez, a summer intern from the Hinckley Institute of Politics at the University of Utah, joined us Monday and will be assisting us with the Latino Leaders Network throughout the summer. <laughs> I said Joe Baca, and I'm already in trouble. <laughs> Paul Gomez, actually not with Joe Baca, I'm thinking of David Ramirez, but of course, Representative Ciro Rodriguez. Thank you. And Paul, please uh, keep me out of trouble, will you? <laughs> Finally, we want to thank Superintendent Susan Castillo. I think it is so important for us to use this platform to introduce you to leaders all around the country. Well, those that live and enjoy our nation's capital sometimes come to the erroneous conclusion that all leadership comes from the Potomac. Those of us that leave the Beltway quite often are reminded that, in fact, 
The community leaders, our state leaders around this country deserve a great deal of thanks, and I'm just delighted that Superintendent Castillo was able to share her vision for a brighter future for Americans' children with all of you today. Again, thank you for joining us.